Let's pray together. Jesus, we, uh, we do praise you. Thanks for bringing us here this morning. Would you uh, continue to instruct our hearts as we turn to your word? Help us to see you for who you really are. Help us to see you as our true king and our shepherd, the one who is leading us along, away from destruction and into eternal life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. You can be seated. <clears throat> when they crucified Jesus, they put a sign, Pilate put a sign above him on the cross, and it simply read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And they had it in a couple different languages to make sure everybody knew what that sign was talking about. I don't know why Pilate <clears throat> wrote that sign, probably because he wanted to show uh, the power of the Roman Empire, and that when you claim to be a king against Rome, this is what happens. Rome wins. What he didn't know, I don't think, was that he was making an actual declaration of the truth about Jesus, that he really was king and is king. And so the question as we enter into Easter season is, uh, why is Jesus coming as a king? We're going to spend a lot of time thinking about that in our reading. We're, we come to the books about Israel's kings in First and Second Samuel <clears throat> and First and Second Kings, and we're going to be noticing a lot of information about Israel's kings. And that's going to put in our minds this idea that Jesus is king. When he came to earth, he, he claimed to be the king of Israel. And the New Testament declares him now to be king over all creation as the resurrected son of God. Uh, that's a key understanding of who Jesus is. The question is why? Why does Jesus do that? Where does this come from? How did Israel get to this point? Because the starting point in, in the rescue from Egypt was that God himself was going to be their king. And then we get to this point where all of a sudden they need an earthly kind of king. And so I want to go to 1 Samuel 8. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. This is where the, a key chapter where Israel articulates a desire for the king. And God grants their request. And the rest of the Old Testament is basically articulating the implications of this conversation that they have with the Lord. It is evaluating the nature of this decision and how good it was and how bad it was. A lot of ink is spilt over this stinking chapter. It's a very important chapter. So as we read through our Bibles, which as a church, that's what we're doing, we, got, we have to talk about 1 Samuel 8. It's important for the overall narrative of scripture. And so um, <clears throat> in this chapter, we're just going to read it and then I'll come back and summarize it, make a couple observations as we are prone to do and try to apply it to our lives in a very simple uh, way that is clear because I think every time you open God's word, we can apply it to our lives. Even this stuff about Israel deciding about wanting a king. Uh, I think we'll see as we read these verses what I'm going to try to point out is that we, what these chapters speak to us about is all of us have this eventual slide where we reject God as king in our lives. We might not outright say that because as Christians we know we're not supposed to. So we never vocalize, I reject you Jesus as king. Some Christians do and that's very heartbreaking. But for the vast majority of Christians, we never say that, we just slowly fade, one decision at a time. And so I think this chapter has great instruction for us to prevent that fade and to keep us on course in the Lord, both as individuals and as a church. Uh, this is a great chapter of scripture. Let's go to verse one. When Samuel became old, Samuel is a dude that uh, was the last judge in Israel and was also kind of the first prophet in a new wave of prophets. Um, he's now old. And he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, or Abiyah. They were judges in Beersheba, which is in the south of the promised land. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So in their deciding disputes, the person that they would decide to approve of or win the case was the person who had the most money. It's a very convenient way for them to rule. It stunk for everybody else. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, which is Samuel's hometown, and said to him, Behold, you are old. There's a great truth. Bro, you are old. 
and your sons do not walk in your ways, meaning you don't have control, you're like you're old and you're not even overseeing your household, like you've gotten just so weak. So it's kind of a, a punch to the gut. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. What a great little sign of faith in the midst of all these stories. You see a guy, even in the midst of great trouble, what does he do first? <sighs> Turn to the Lord. So he prays. And I would imagine he's thinking God is going to say one thing, but God totally surprises him. Yahweh says to Samuel, obey the, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. As they've done to me, Samuel, I'm their rightful king. They're rejecting me, and so as they do to me, they'll do to my servants. You are in good company, Samuel. I'm with you in this. But here's the plan. Do what they want. Totally surprising. We would think God's going to just... You guys are rejecting me in a final way. We're done. Let's bring down the hammer. No, he just says, give them what they want. Only obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of Yahweh to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, guys, these are going to be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them to to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. I don't know why, but running before chariots was a sign of status. I don't know who wanted that job, why that was a thing, but that's what people did. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, meaning he's going to have this massive army that's going to need delegation and organization, not just this hodgepodge group of raiders and guerrilla warfare. There's going to be this organization to it. There's going to be some military might. And, and he will bring some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. Israel will no longer be this group of of tribes, it will become a nation where the king now is focused on building and amassing a, 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 an army. And so the culture will move away from, from a generous blessing and it will now move to hoarding and protecting assets. That's the idea here. That's where the king goes. It goes away from, he goes away from generosity and towards just amassing his own empire and protecting their own little thing. That's a warning. That's not how God designed his people to function and live. He will take your daughters. So he'll take your sons and do this military stuff. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. So the daughters will be taken from home and meant to serve the comfort of the king. The culture of Israel will be no longer about, about making sure everybody's taken care of. It will be about this king consuming the resources and pursuing his own comfort. And that leadership will bleed to everybody else. That it will now become about pursuing yours and getting your gain at the expense of other people. Getting your comfort at the expense of other people. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He'll take a tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. Again, supporting the war effort. He'll take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. All of your work of trying to build and amass an inheritance and, and to create a settlement for your family to survive, not just in this generation, but in future generations. All of that can be stolen away from you by this leader because he's concerned about his own thing. That will be the culture in Israel if you guys really want this king. Verse 17, he will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. There's the clincher right there. That's the summary of this whole thing. They're going to be slaves. Which, guess what they left as in Egypt? Slavery. Guess now what they're wanting? Slavery. There's this exchanging one form of slavery for another, and that's what God is making sure they understand very clearly. And in this day you'll cry out because of your king whom you've chosen for yourself, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. Surprise, surprise. And they said, no, that's not how it's going to go. We're much better than that. 
There shall be a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in in the ears of Yahweh. Again, like, Lord, what are we going to do? And the Lord says to Samuel, obey their voice, voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city, meaning let's start this process and we'll get it. And by the end of chapter 12, they have Saul now appointed as king and they start this new trajectory of kings. Let me summarize this story with a couple of points and we'll draw some application. Very clearly we have the people of Yahweh rejecting Yahweh as king. That is very clearly stated in verse 7. They don't like how Yahweh is ruling them, and they want something different. And that is uh, terrible. They want something that looks a little more familiar. This thing of, of being ruled directly by Yahweh doesn't feel familiar. They want to be like the other nations. So they, they want a king. That's the main thing. And there's three reasons very clearly that they give. First, they want a king to be like other nations. Verse 5 and verse 20. Give us a king to judge us like all the nations. Verse 20. That we may be like all the nations. God has spent all this time with Israel generation after generation, saying, I'm saving you and and redeeming you to be holy, unlike all the other nations. I'm, I'm wanting to save you and set up this different way of living so that you can demonstrate true life to the rest of the world so they'll see that and wanna come and be a part of this thing. They wanna come and and serve me, they want to come and worship me, they'll convert by looking at how Israel lives their life. And Israel now is saying, no, we want to be like the other nations. That's why they want a king, because that's how all the other nations are operating. They want to fit in. They're like a bunch of 13-year-olds. No offense to the 13-year-olds in here. By the way, adults want to do the same thing. We're all 13-year-olds deep inside. We go to a new place, and we're just trying to, where, where do I go? I don't want to be here, here. We just want to fit in. That's where Israel's at. They just want to fit in. Not only that, but they, they've watched the success of these other nations. And right now, in their worldview, in their perspective, it looks like these other nations with kings are more successful because they keep coming into Israel and Israel can't defeat them. And the reason they come up with in their minds is because well, they have a king and, a, and a, an organized army. We're a bunch of ragtag raiders. Sometimes God raises up a judge and we got like 200 guys. We go and sometimes we win, sometimes we don't. We keep being oppressed. We want to be like those people that seem to have more success and endurance and, and organization. So the grass is always greener on the other side. But God wants to widen their perspective. That's why he gives them the warning. Like, do you... Do you really want to be like the other nations? Like, seriously, go to the Moabites and go to these other nations and talk to the people and really see, like, do you really want the kingdom that they have? See how terrible it actually is. This is what it's like. But we can understand that. I mean, have you ever felt like non-Christians are more prosperous than Christians? Have you ever felt like it seems like even when I do the right thing, it doesn't work out for me? Yeah, we feel that all the time because this world is evil and things don't work out even when you do the right thing. That's what they're feeling. And so the solution is let's merge a little bit. Let's try to get a king in here and try to have the best of both worlds. So they want a king to be like other nations. They want a king to judge them. That's what they say again in verse 5 and verse 20. Basically what they want is a king um, uh, to lead them when they need him to and to not have to wait for the Lord to raise up a leader. Because up until now, that's the system. When they need a national leader or a multi-tribal leader, God raises one up. They don't want that weight anymore. And they don't want God to have to appoint someone. They just want to appoint someone for good and let that family take care of it. That's, that's the idea of they want someone to judge them. And not only that, so there's that uh, idea of just having one leader, but that also uh, lifts the responsibility from the local delegation of leaders. Again, the elders of the tribes are the ones that were primarily supposed to be the deciders and, and the conflict resolvers, and they're sick of that job. Because it makes enemies, and they don't want to be the bad guy, and so let's just, make the, let's just turn it over to the king. We don't want to make the decisions. We don't want to make the enemies. We don't want to be the bad guys. Let's just get a leader in charge. That way we can blame the king. You know, guys, I, would, I wouldn't tax you. It's the, it's the king's fault. 
We do that. Even today, that's a, a major pull in our flesh. We want to somehow create layers of responsibility to avoid conflict and personal responsibility in the problems. Israel's wanting to uh, have a judge, a permanent ruling family. Third, they said, we want this king to fight our battles. We, we want a king who will go out before us and fight our battles in verse 20. They're looking for a king to solve the surfacey problem. And when they looked at their existence as a nation, what they saw is the problem of foreign invaders and not being able to withstand those attacks and being oppressed. That was the problem in their eyes. And they were tired of that problem. And so what they sought to do was solve that problem by having a king of their own who could amass an army quickly and go out to fight those enemies and have a way of organizing and doing battle that would defeat oppression. That was how to solve that problem. They wanted a king to do that. The issue is, and as we look at the book of Judges and even Joshua, the issue is not that Israel doesn't have an organized army. The issue is that they're not following the Lord. And so you can have a king with an organized army, but if he's not following the Lord, then who cares? They're still going to get whooped. But Israel's not seeing that. All they see is the surface problem and they're trying to solve that because that feels urgent and that's a problem that's out there. It doesn't doesn't force them to look inside their own hearts because that's what, we don't want to do that. The problem's out there, it's not in here. And so they very clearly have these motivations. And what we're supposed to do is go to Deuteronomy 17 because all along in the Pentateuch, God has been promising a king. And so it can be a little bit confusing, like, wait, is it good or bad to have a king? And then we got to go to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17 is what the book of 1 Samuel has in mind and it's really what the rest of the Old Testament has in mind as it looks at the stories of the kings. So I'm going to read verses 14 through 17 of Deuteronomy 17. Now we'll go all the way to verse 20. So God's instructing the people. He says, when you come in the land that Yahweh or God's giving you and you possess it and dwell it and then say, I'll set a king... I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as a king, not a foreigner, but one of you. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since Yahweh has said to you, you shall never return that way again. Guess what Solomon did, by the way? Went down to Egypt and got horses. And each of these things, by the way, the text is very careful to point out what they did wrong out of this list. And you'll see it as you read. He shall not acquire many wives for himself. Oops, that's like every king that we'll read about. Lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire himself excessive silver and gold. All things that kings do of the nations. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh as God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he might not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. This type of king is very different than what Israel's wanting. Hopefully you're seeing that. They're misdiagnosing the problem. What Israel needs is not a military commander who will fight their battles. What Israel needs is the kind of king in Deuteronomy 17 that is a spiritual leader that will keep the nation in direct obedience to Yahweh's covenant and guide them in a relationship of fearing the Lord holistically and and practicing righteousness and justice. When that happens, Yahweh will preserve and protect So they need that kind of leader, but Israel in in 1 Samuel 8 is not wanting that kind of leader. They're wanting the wrong kind of king, and that's the problem. And so the desire to have a king is understandable in Yahweh's mind. He made provisions for that. He's promising that, but not this kind of king that they're wanting. That's the real issue. And God is trying to warn them of that. And so what we have in, in 1 Samuel 8 is a real tragedy. If they would have come to Samuel and said, look, Samuel, we're a mess." 
We can't get our families right. We keep following after idols. We keep on mixing idolatry with the worship of Yahweh. Some of our Levitical priests even are going after bribes and, and our judges are going after bribes. This is a mess. We need a leader to come and restore us and help us remember the Torah and the instruction, the Ten Commandments, and really learn to follow God rightly. We need a king to do that. That would have been a much different conversation. And the rest of the Old Testament would probably be far different. And we never get that kind of king until Jesus. And that's why we follow Jesus. And that's why this passage is so important, and Deuteronomy is very important for us to understand who Jesus is and why he lived the way that he did. Because he's a king that can spiritually lead his people. And he's going to do that one day. He's coming back, and he's actually going to fulfill that role. And we're going to worship and serve him. It's going to be awesome. Right now, we're just telling people, hey, that king is coming. And so, um, they want a king for those three basic reasons. Uh, They're rejecting God's rule, and that has two problems that Samuel basically articulates. The first problem is a series of six he will takes. Six of them. God gives them this warning to try and widen their perspective, to try and get them to see the bigger picture. Hey, if you're wanting this type of king, here's where it's going to lead. You don't actually want this. He's going to... He's going to take your sons. He's going to drive our culture to be more about self-preservation. He's going, to, he's going to be selfish. He's going to amass wealth for himself and only care really about his own personal well-being at the expense of your and your families, which, by the way, is not like Yahweh at all. Up until this point, Yahweh has given them great freedom. He's given them great abundance. They have everything they need and more. But they want the enslavement. They want the pursuit of comfort. The king will take their fields, he'll take their land of produce. In other words, the land will be driven by financial gain rather than financial stewardship. Financial gain becomes a priority. Just take and take and take. Where in God's uh, economy, he provides, he provides, he provides, and we give, we give, we give. It's the antithesis. And so what we see here in these warnings is that Israel will slide away, both their king and the nation itself will slide away from their purpose and their mission. Their mission is to be a blessing to their nations. Their purpose is to receive blessing from Yahweh and to give it to the nations. When they get this kind of king, that will not happen. They will become a nation that takes and that sets up their walls and tries to stay closed in. So God gives them that warning. Hey, it's going to be destructive because you're going against the reason that I've formed you. The reason that we're in covenant. This isn't going to work. And so the second problem is a very somber verse in verse 18. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you've chosen for yourselves. But Yahweh will not answer you in that day. That's harsh. That's harsh but real. What that's, what's God is saying there is, I'm going to let you experience the fruit of your decision. He's making it clear. This decision that you guys want, this type of king, is a clear rejection of me. And you don't want to be in a situation where you're rejecting the Lord, because there will come a time in your life where you will cry out to him and need him, and he won't answer, is what he's telling his people. I'm not going to answer because you've rejected me, and I want you to see that you shouldn't reject me, because you actually do need me as your king. And that will get realized in the moment that you have a hard time. Does that sound familiar? Different economy now, God answers Because of what Jesus has done. But we see the pattern. And we can see what God's doing here. He's, he's going to let them experience the fruit of their ways. I'm gonna, he's basically saying, I'm going to give you what you want so that you see you don't actually want it. To see that there's more to life than just being like the other nations and having this kind of king. So Israel rejected what they truly needed. Even after hearing from the Lord directly. They did not change their ways. They did not give up their stubborn heart. And so uh, they've decided that they want a culture that is uh, bent towards self-preservation 
self-protection. They want a culture of taxes. They want a culture of slavery. That's how they want to live their lives, rather than in the freedom and grace that Yahweh gives. And we'll see how this decision plays out. And the amazing thing about God is that he never lets them fully realize this kind of life. He's merciful and gracious and guiding them through this and even eventually provides a king, uh, which is quite remarkable. So how do we apply this? What, uh, what can we take from this? Um, you know, we live in a, in a world that has rejected God's rule. And I've had a lot of conversations in the last three or four years uh, on that topic, especially in regards to our own country. We, we are saying that, man, it, we are in this phase where our country is really rejecting God's rule. And there has never been a time in human history where a country has accepted God's rule. Humans rejected God's rule. 1 Samuel 8 is meant to be patterned after Genesis 3 and Genesis 11, showing that this is what humans do. No matter what situation God provides, and no matter what he does, humans reject God as their ruler, and they want to set up their own way of ruling and hopefully sprinkle a little God in there. That's what humans do. And that's what humans have been doing throughout history. Israel is a demonstration of that, and the world that we see today is a demonstration of that. Go around any nation, and you'll see a demonstration of what it looks like to reject God's rule. But we ourselves, like I said earlier, we ourselves also have this tendency to slide away from God's rule in our lives, from obedience to his ways, we, we tend to want to go our own ways. We feel that slide. We never outright say, God, I don't, I don't want you to be in my life anymore because we know we're not supposed to say that, but we say it in small, little ways. God, I don't really want to talk to you about that. I don't want to do that in my life. And so we shut him out. It's just a little part of our life. And then eventually, it's two months go by, and the great symptom is you haven't been in church or you haven't even really even talk to the Lord after two months, six months, six years, whatever it is. And that was because of a one little decision where you said, you know, I don't want your voice here, Lord. Don't tell me what to do here. Or you're just mad at how he is ruling your life. You don't like how slow he is. Or you don't like his particular answer in a certain situation. It seems like he's not acting or doing something the way that you want it to. And so that begins the slide. I don't really think he knows what he's doing. Let me take over this situation and try to figure it out myself. And then you do that in one situation, and then you do it in the next, and the next, and the next. And again, six years go by, and all of a sudden, the Lord's nowhere in your life. And I'm not saying you've lost your standing with the Lord. Once we're in God's family, we're never out. But it does create a destructive way of living. And so I want to give three things from this chapter uh, that will help us as a church demonstrate an alternative way of living to our world. I want to be a church that, that accepts Jesus as our king. That's why we're here. That's who's formed this church is Jesus himself, to be a group of people that are established in his rule and living that out in our world. That's our, that's our desire as a church, amen? That's why we're here, amen? We, want, we, we believe Jesus is king. We want to live that out. We don't want to slide away. So let me give three things to, to, to watch for or to pursue to prevent that slide away in, in a world that has rejected God's rule. And you could see that on full demonstration today. It is sad. We, we live in a sad state of affairs. It is lamentable where our world is at. Amen? So the question is, what do we do? Well, I think second, 1 Samuel 8 gives us at least three things. First, you need to stay focused on the pursuit of King Jesus in the midst of circumstances. Stay focused on the pursuit of King Jesus. Don't neglect the the task of spiritual maturity in your life. That's what Israel is doing. Israel is looking at their situations and seeing the problem of foreign invaders and trying to tackle that problem rather than seeing it as a symptom of a deeper issue in their own hearts. We will do the same thing. We will start going after the difficult thing in our life or, the, or the, even, even the nice thing in our life. We'll just chase the circumstances rather than focusing on our own spiritual maturity and our maturity, our, 
our walk with the Lord will start to get off track and we'll lose out on progress because we're just honed in on solving the particular circumstance and asking God to solve that circumstance. And so we want to be people that focus on the pursuit of Jesus, keeping our eyes on him and maintaining a a perspective on our spiritual maturity and our our walk with him in the midst of, of life. That's a huge vision for the church. So we're not going to tell you the ABCs of living life in East Mesa. But what we'll do as a group is we'll push each other to spiritual maturity so that you can live this life no matter what comes at you in the way that God wants you to live. That's why we exist. That's what we're doing here. Believe it or not. It's real. And it matters for the way that we live our lives. So don't neglect the spiritual maturity in your life. It's amazing how when we face things in our lives, the first thing to go out the window is our spiritual habits. When something new happens in our life or there's a change of routine, we don't stop eating. We make sure we don't stop eating. But it's amazing how quickly the spiritual habits, the ways of connecting with the Lord, well, I'm out of the routine and this sort of thing. That's just what happens. We've got to stay focused on King Jesus and push each other to stay focused on him. Submission to the Lord is important. He's king. We have to uh, keep on course of pursuing a life patterned after King Jesus. Jesus came and, and lived a, a life that was meant to be followed. And so we're following him and doing life as, as he kind of showed us to live. And that's God's great plan of salvation. Second, be generous rather than self-protective. We as a church, as a group of people, we want to be generous people rather than self-protective. Life can so quickly become about self-protection and preservation. And we are guilty of that. As soon as we see... um, how separate we are from the way the world lives their lives. Our natural tendency is to separate, cut, and run, and put up fences and walls and protect our own nice little subculture. That's what we'll tend to do. We'll just tend to isolate, and God never says to do that. There's never a verse in the New Testament that says, oh, hey, by the way, in this hard season, stop spreading the gospel and stop being a blessing to people. Just, just close yourselves in and just, just be your nice little family and that'll be great for a while. And then I'll, I'll tell you when you can share the gospel. He doesn't do that because that goes against his plan and purposes for you and I and for this church and for the world. And so our tendency when we face situations like we're facing now, we're watching the world and we're seeing it, it's a downward slide for sure. People have rejected God as their king and that just leads to more and more destruction. We'll watch that. Our tendency is to withdraw. And that's not the heart of God. His His heart for us as a church is to engage that. And so that's what we need to do. We do that with generosity. We don't need to protect our certain way of life. That's God's responsibility. He will protect our way of life, because it's his. And we can trust him with that. We need to share our lives. And again, another way of saying that is we pursue financial stewardship rather than financial gain. Financial stewardship rather than financial gain. Stewardship is the mindset that all I have has been given to me to be, to, to be dealt with responsibly. Financial gain has to do with all I have, I've gotten, and I just want more. Let me be the person with the most. That's what kings do. And that's what God's warning Israel would slide into is that type of mentality. And that's not God's mentality. God's mentality is to provide for his people so that they can be a blessing to other people. That he provides. He gives, gives, gives so that we can give, give, give. And so that's how we, we want to live our lives. We want to be generous. And again, not just with money, but with our very lives, with our, with our souls, with our thoughts, with our, all of our assets. We seek to, to say, okay, how can I be a blessing to people rather than how can I hold on to this and make sure I get it? That's, uh, I think, really important in our day and age. 
Third, we want to bless others rather than get comfortable. Life can so quickly become a pursuit of personal comfort. Life can so quickly become a pursuit of personal comfort. That's what the, the warning is, is that the king would have bakers and perfumers. That's pursuing personal comfort. And that's when you reject God's ways, that's what life becomes about. And, and it's tough because we're all stressed. We have all kinds of hard things. We're maxed out emotionally. We can, ma- we can max out at work. We're maxed out at all kinds of things. The last thing we want to do uh, at night when we, before we go to bed is just engage with the Lord because we're so exhausted, we're so tired. We just, we're just trying to pursue comfort and, and, and kind of reprieve from the of life. And God says, actually, in that moment, he calls us to be a blessing to others. It might be in those moments that actually he wants you to bless someone rather than just, let me pursue uh, this bowl of ice cream. That's what it is for me, right? I share that all the time. Man, that bowl of ice cream is great. What do I do if that gets interrupted? It's a little simple things like that, but there's, there's other ways that we can do that as well. So we want to be a church that doesn't just pursue personal comfort for comfort's sake. We want to be a church that is a blessing to others and seeks to do that even though we're maxed out. You're not going to, if you're new to this church, you're not going to find a group of people that isn't maxed out. We have our stresses, we have our pain, we have our hardships, we have all kinds of things we're bringing today to this room, asking the Lord for help. And we cry out to him, and absolutely we should do that, and God will meet you in that. He'll provide, he strengthens, he does all of his work. But you're not gonna find a group of people that isn't maxed out. What you're gonna hopefully find is a group of people in the midst of being maxed out, seeking to be a blessing. That is a different way of living, isn't it? And that's what God has called us to in the midst of a world that has rejected God as their king. We're followers of King Jesus. He is the king, and he's coming back one day. And uh, we want to worship and serve him. As we enter into this Easter season, we'll spend a lot of time reflecting upon Jesus as king, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for how the Lord has orchestrated that. I wish I could say I planned that, and I didn't. I realized it this week. It's amazing how God has put I was like, in Easter, we're going to be in 2 Kings. How am I going to give an Easter message in 2 Kings? It's for, God's making it happen. It's awesome. What a, what a time to be reading these portions of Scripture together. We want to spend the last few moments of our service worshiping Jesus uh, as our provider. He's, he's, he's our king. He's provided us with the Holy Spirit. And he is the one who's our refuge and the one who we cry out to. And so we want to sing a couple songs declaring that together. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll sing. God, we uh, are grateful for these verses. There's so much more we could talk about and say, but... Lord, you're gracious and and merciful. We are so uh, grateful for that. We're reminded of even in the midst of our mixed motives and Israel's mixed motives of wanting a king and that sort of thing, you're working within that to actually provide a real, true, everlasting king. And we are grateful. We praise you. Speak to our hearts continually now. Help us to see you for who you really are and to see us for who we really are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.